Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. For example, Paul wrote in Romans 1 7. First of all, let's go with the Bible reference. Okay, Romans 1 7, and the second is 1 Corinthians. First Corinthians chapter uh, one verse three, and uh, we're going to start including the uh, Colossians. Colossians chapter. <coughs> chapter 1 and verse 3. Okay, and then we have again the first Thessalonian. We have first Thessalonian chapter 3 verse 11. Okay, so what does the greetings in the epistles indicate? Okay, thus the greetings in the epistles indicates that God is a Trinity. Okay, so this is a couple of questions that we need to raise to understand what does the greetings in the epistles, in the letters, okay, that in, in the in the in the epistles of the New Testament truly indicates. What does it mean? So let's go one by one. Okay, first of all, we'll read. The Romans 1 7. The Romans 1 7 says, from the Romans chapter 1, verse 7, and to all that be in Rome, beloved God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Number one. Does this Preciosi, or we can say the phrases, this type of, okay, the, uh, the phrases, does this indicate a separation of the person? Or you can say, does this Preciosi indicate a separation of persons? And what about the 1 Corinthians 1 3? The 1 Corinthians 1 3 says, again, okay, grace be to you and peace. From God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. So if it were to be interpreted, there would be several, several serious problems with which to contend. First of all, we'd like to uh, enlighten ourselves that we also understand that it does not mention the Holy Ghost. Okay? So the greetings and epistles cannot, okay, indicates the doctrines of Trinity because what is missing, that is the Holy Spirit. Okay, the Holy Ghost is number one uh, mentioned over here. Now, even if it's a mention, still it does not indicate the Trinity. The concept of Trinity was adopted after the 3280, after 300 years later, after the Church of the Lord, the Pentecostal Church, the New Testament Church was established on the 30th AD. And we have already uh, discussed, we have already explained about the origins of Trinity in the previous class. And we know that according to the Old Testament and New Testament, there is no place for the doctrines of Trinity because the Trinity is simply the pagan's doctrine originated from the pagans. So first of all, we would like to understand from these greetings and epistles that there is no mention of the Holy Ghost. And even if there is a mention of the Holy Ghost, still it does not indicate the Trinity. 
Now, even if these greetings are interpreted to teach a separation of persons that they do not endorse the doctrine of the Trinity. From this interpretation, the greetings could be the greeting could states Benitarianisms. Okay, Benitarians. So when you say Benitarians, for a lot of people, you may not know Benitarian. Benitarianism. Okay, when you say Benitarianism, what does it mean by Benitarianism? Benitarianism is a belief in two gods. Okay? So even if you are going to interpret literally because of the word, okay, such as father and uh, sons, because of this phraseology, because of the phrase that says as God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, even if we interpret it literally, then this will not endorse the doctrine of the Trinity, but it will endorse this one. So, what is Benitarianism? Benitarianism is a belief in two gods. Or they could also relegate to the Holy Ghost to a junior role in the Trinity. The second one that we want to talk about is that if we interpret other similar passages to indicate a separate persons in the Godhead, we could easily have a four or five persons in the God. For example, okay, we can see that in Colossians chapter 2 verse 2 speaks of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ. And other verses scripture talks about God and the Father. So that means if you're going to uh, make it separately because of this phrase or because of the words that says God and the Father, if you're going to make it separate, separate, then you end up having a multiples of gods. Okay, one example is that Colossians 2 2. Let's read out from the KZB Bible, the Colossians chapter 2 and verse 2. Have a read from the Colossians. Chapter 2, verse 2 say. Okay, we know. That your heart might be comforted with life together in love and unto all riches of the full and assurance of understanding unto the, the acknowledgement of the mastery of God and of the Father and Oh, okay, everybody underlined the mystery of God. Suppose if the word God is a separate person, and if we say Father is separate, Christ is separate, then here also you have okay a multiple of gods. But we know that Apostle Paul is a, a monotheist. He believe that there is only one God. He's not a, a member of the Roman Catholic Church. He was not part of the pagan religions. Even before his conversion, he was a Jewish man. And understand that according to the Old Testament, okay, there is only one God in a person. There is only one God in another. So, for the Jewish people, to say that God is more than one is considered as a blasphemy. Because according to the Old Testament Hebrew, it's absolutely clear that God is absolute one. Okay, even in the time of the Lord Jesus Christ, even in the early days, all the Jewish people, including the Pharisees, they all believe in the existence of the one God. All right, to believe in more than one God is always considered as a blasphemy or as a pagan's religion and pagan origin or pagan's doctrine. Okay, point number two. So there we understand the one who says here in Colossians 7, 2 verse 2, Apostle Paul goes on to say in Colossians 2, 9, for example, so therefore I've been saying from the previous classes that we must let the scripture in the previous scripture. For example, if Paul is endorsing, okay, doctrines of more than one God, then why would he say in Colossians 2, 9, okay, what about this? According to Apostle Paul again, all right, he goes on to say that Jesus Christ is all in all. He is the Father, He is the Son, He is Jehovah, Yahweh, He is the Savior, all right, He is our Redeemer, He is our God, He is our, okay, the Holy Spirit, and He is the Father. So according to Apostle Paul, if you see here again the Epistles of Colossians, chapter 2 verse 9, Paul goes on to say, for in Him, which means for in Christ Jesus, dwelleth all the fullness of the God of bodily. Everybody know 
the Colossians 2 9 is referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You see that? So when you let the scripture interpret the scriptures, then you can clearly see that Paul was not endorsing the doctrines of Benetarianism, neither he was endorsing the doctrines of Trinitarianism. So, okay, Trinitarianism. Okay, so this is called a believe in three God. This is called a believe in two gods. So Apostle Paul was neither endorsing the doctrines of Unitarians or Unitarianism, neither he was endorsing the doctrines of Trinitarianism. Why? Because if you let the scripture speak out, if you let the scripture interpret the scriptures, then here in Colossians 2 9, Apostle Paul goes on to say that in him, in Christ Jesus, dwelleth all the fullness of the God of bodily, and ye are complete in him. That means you're totally completed in Christ alone. Amen. You don't need any other God in order to have salvation. In order to have the eternity, you don't need any other God because you only have only one God and his name is Jesus. And therefore, Apostle Paul said, you are, ye are complete in him. Amen. Hallelujah. But where is the Roman Catholics will not accept that? Okay, for them, you cannot be complete in Jesus Christ. You can only be complete when you believe in the three separate gods, such as the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. You're only complete when you believe that God is three persons. God exists from eternity as three separate persons. Okay, so they, they would say there is only one God, but at the same time, they would go on and say, one God, but yet a three separate person. That's the reason why, if you still remember the Trinity, uh, uh, the chart, we call it diagram, okay, the chart of the Trinity. Okay, they would say the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So for those who have already attended the Bible seminary in, previous, uh, in, the, in your previous uh, education, you would have understood. Okay, what I'm talking about. You would clearly understand what I'm saying. Isn't it? So, while the Catholics does acknowledge the Father is God, they would all acknowledge the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God, but they would say, is not. Okay, here is again, is not. What does it mean? Is not. That means, Son is God, but not Father. Son is God, but not Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is God, but not the Son. Holy Spirit is God, but not the Father. Father is God, but not the Son. Father is God, but not the Holy Spirit. Is that clear? So that's what they're saying. All right, everybody said God is a three separate persons. So in the Godhead, according to the Roman Catholics, the doctrine they have a three separate gods, which is a very much foreign to the biblical teaching, which was which is a very much a foreign to the Bible. Alright, so even the word there for the Trinity is nowhere to be found in the Bible. Even its terminology is nowhere to be found in the Holy Bible. Is it clear? So therefore understand, okay, for those people who, who are thinking that Paul must be endorsing at least the Benetarianism or Trinitarianism, okay, because of the Col Colossians chapter 2 verse 2, please keep in mind that the same, you know, author, the same writer, was writing this, even including the Colossians 2 2, goes on to say that in Christ alone, in Jesus Christ alone, all the fullness of God had bodily. Amen. In, in Christ, dwell all the fullness of God had. And then he goes on to say that we are completing him, who is the head of all the principalities and power. So, according to Paul, that we are complete in Christ alone. That means Jesus our Father, He's our Son, He's our Savior, He's our Holy Spirit. Okay, He's our God, He's our Lord Almighty, everything. That Jesus Christ is all in all. Jesus is indeed our everything according to Colossians chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. You see that? So therefore understand. Now let's go to the other point is that if the salutations do not indicate, okay, if the greetings, if the salutations, the greetings do not indicate a plurality, a plurality of persons in the Godhead, what do they mean by referring to the Father 
and the Lord Jesus Christ, the writers, the apostles were emphasizing the two roles of God and the importance of accepting, accepting Him in both the roles. Please keep in mind. Amen. So, if the salutations in the epistles, if the greetings in the epistles are not indicating or endorsing the plurality in the Godhead, then what do they really mean then? Okay? What do they mean? What does the salutations, the greetings and epistles really mean then? We need to understand that the writers, the apostles, were simply emphasizing the two roles of Jesus Christ. Okay? It is also important to accept both the roles because he's both God and man. Okay, you all need to understand that. At the same time, he's also the Lord, not only the Lord, but even God. Okay? And he's even our Savior because he literally, because God was manifested in the flesh, God incarnated, and even died on the Calvary. So, Jesus Christ is also our Savior. So, we need to understand the writers, the apostles, were emphasizing the two roles of God, the importance of accepting the Jesus Christ and all his roles. Not only must we believe in God as a creator and a father, but we must also accept him as a manifested in the flesh through Jesus Christ. Everyone must acknowledge that Jesus has come in the flesh and that he is both Lord and Christ. Okay, he is both Jehovah and the Messiah. Now when I say Christ, okay, Christ simply means the Messiah, the anointed one. So therefore, everyone must acknowledge that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, that he is born, our Lord, and our Savior. So consequently, the salutations or the greetings in the epistles emphasize the belief not only in God with the Jews and many pagans accepted, but also in God as a reveal to Christ. And that is the third point, the fourth point that we need to study here is a study of Greek text is a very interesting in connection with these greetings or you can say salutation Bible passages, okay? For the location of the Greek in these passages, when we uh, consolidate from the interleaving Greek English a New Testament, all right, we can understand that how that even the Trinitarian scholars, that many Christian scholars from millions, are distinguished, okay? Even the Greek scholars clearly make this explanation. That the word translated, as we all know, the word and, a and the end, is from the Greek word chi. It can be translated as and or as even, okay? In the sense that is or which is the same as. For example, you can address me with simply, with simply salutations, all right? Okay, Malte is our, all right, teacher and our principal. You can say he's our brother and our teacher. Okay, that's I am. You can say he's my teacher and my pastor. But that doesn't mean that you are referring to, the, to different, different persons, but you're referring to me, all right, but you're accepting me in those roles as well. You're regarding, you're giving regards to those roles that I have. Because my role is not just being a pastor or a writer or those, you know, Bible teacher, but I may have different roles. So you are acknowledging and you're giving that regards and acknowledging all my roles. So if you say, Dr. Mount is my, okay, brother and my friend, you're accepting the roles as well. And if you say he's my teacher and my pastor, again, you're not referring to two different persons, but you're referring to the same person, but at the same time, you're acknowledging my roles, okay, because my roles and my title is not just limited to just one. All right, for example, uh, you know, St. Thomas, if you look at the old, uh, New Testament, the Gospel of John, very interestingly, you can see one example here is the, the Gospel of John. You can see that in the John chapter 20. Okay, let's turn the Bible to John chapter 20. And here in verse 29 and 28, and Thomas answered 
and said unto him, My Lord and my God. What does he say? He said, My Lord and my God. Was Apostle Thomas addressing the two different gods? Was he addressing to Jesus and another God? No, my friend. He's addressing to only one person. He's only addressing to Jesus Christ alone. But at the same time, he goes on to say that you are my Lord and my God. Amen. Was well, most of the time that even we fail to understand that. Okay, as a believer, as a Christian, sometimes we simply uh, accept that Jesus is a Savior, He's the Lord. But when it comes to uh, the title of God, because some people deny that, don't say that Jesus is God. Jesus is our Savior, but that doesn't mean that He's God. Okay, some people get offended when you say that Jesus Christ is God. Now here you can see that Apostles Thomas, okay, Thomas here acknowledged that Jesus is only not only the Lord, but He is also God Himself. And therefore, what did He say? He cried out to the Lord Jesus and said, "My Lord and my God." So the Greek word is again God. What does it mean? It simply means that he's saying, All right, you are my Lord, even, okay? Even my God. Amen. You see that? So when you see these kinds of uh, <coughs> uh, greetings in the, in the Bible passages, or when you see these kinds of salutations, such as the repeated salutations and phraseology, such as Father, God, etc., Savior, okay, don't try to separate it, don't try to interpret in the physical sense. And literally, and don't try to say that you know God must be three or God must be four persons. So therefore, we can see here uh, even the Bible uh, translates it says under God and and the often agreed that the phrase denotes only of one being or one person. Okay, look at here. Uh, I'm going to give you an example. Let's go with the straight Ephesians five five. Okay, the Ephesians chapter five verse five. We have an example of this, the use of Kai in the Greek text. Have a look at here in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 5 says, The kingdom of Christ and of God. Okay? You can turn to Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 5. Have read it from Ephesians 5 5. The Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 5 clearly says, For this know that no whoremongers, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, had any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. So now, does it mean? Okay, here apostle addressing the two different gods. We all know that it is not. Amen. All right. So therefore understand the render word kai in the Greek word which is end, the phrase denotes only one being or one person. Okay? Now let's go to the second one. The second example is Galatians 1.4. The Galatians 1.4 says God and our Father. Alright? So then again in Galatians chapter 4 and verse oh, no, 1 and 4, yes. Galatians chapter 1 verse 4 says, Who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil war according to the will of God and our Father. Correct? Does it mean that Paul is addressing to two different gods? Is, does it mean that God is a different person? Does it mean that the Father is a separate person? No, my friend. Okay? Paul is addressing to the same God, addressing to the, the Almighty God, the same God. Amen. But then at the same time, God is also our Father. So why do we need to accept God even in His roles? Okay? The reason why we need to accept Him is because God created us. Amen. God literally created you and me. And that's what the Bible says, isn't it? Therefore, in John 1, 3, what does the Bible say there? All things are created by Him or made by Him. And nothing I made that was made. And when you turn the Bible, it is Zone 1 3, Zone 1 10, Colossians 1 16. Okay, we can also understand that. That Jesus Christ is not only our Savior, 
He's not, only, he's not only the Son of God, but at the same time, He is also our Father because He is our Creator. All right, look at here in John 3. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Okay. So here for Galatians 1, 4, here Apostle Paul said, God and our Father. So is this God a separate person? Is it the Father a separate person? No. Okay, so therefore it is important to understand here, okay, that Apostle Paul said, and, which is the Greek word for God, that means if you interpret it literally, then you can say it this way, God, even who is our Father, that's what he was trying to give a message to the church at Galatia. Amen? So if you, if you analyze, if you study the context, Apostle Paul is saying, that God, who is even our Father as well, who is also even our Father. That's the meaning. Okay, so don't try to, okay, think about the two different gods. And don't try to think that God is a separate and Father is a separate. Remember, we, ad we address God as a Father because He created us. Okay? Patien and Kappa, right? What is the trend? God is our Patien, God is our God. Is our God. But why do we need to address him as kapao? Why do we need to address him as pa? Barun kapa. Why? Why is this necessary to address him as a father in heaven? Barun kapa, isn't it? How does you say your language? Bantu kwa iya ummi kapa. Ah, Why don't we just say bantu ma ummi kapatien? Why is it necessary sometimes to address him as our father? Okay? Why? Because he created us, isn't it? God created us. God made us. He created us. Therefore, we need to accept that he's a creator. And therefore, it is also important for us to address him as our father. Not only to address him as our God. So that is exactly what Paul is doing over here. So Paul is not... Okay, addressing the two different in you know, God, he's not saying that God is a separate person and the Father is a separate one. That, that's not the point here. Is that clear, Zon? Yes. So he's simply accepting all the roles of God. Amen. All the greatness, okay, attributes of God. <clears throat> and therefore he said, God and our Father. That means he's giving the due that regards the due, okay, respect to the Almighty God. Because God made us and therefore God created us. And therefore he also say, who is our father. Amen. So why do we need to address God as a father? It's because he created us literally. Alright. And that reason why in Colossians 1.16 Paul says that Jesus Christ is not only the sons that God manifests in the flesh. But he, including he is our creator and our father himself. Why? Because the Bible said in Colossians 1.16, visible, invisible, thrones dominant, all things are created by him and for him. Therefore, when you turn the Bible to the book of Revelation, we can see that Jesus Christ promised to be our Father for eternity. Okay, let's read out Revelation 21. Revelation 21 and verse 6. Yes, anybody? And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto you that is a star of the children of the water of life freely. Okay, verse 7 now. Let's go to verse 7. He said, Over the land, the earth will remain all things. And I will be his son. And he shall be my son. Okay, amen. Please underline that. Okay, verse 7, I will be his God and he shall be my son. So if we are the son of Jesus, then it is absolutely clear that he is our father, isn't it? And that is the reason why the prophet Isaiah was not ashamed to declare by saying that Jesus Christ, who is the son and the child, is also our God at the same time the everlasting father. That means... That Christ alone will remain as our Father for eternity. Now let's go with the third example. Okay, uh, we're going to see that in 2 Thessalonians. 
chapter 1, verse 2. Okay, let's read out first 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 12. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 12. What does it say there? 2 Thessalonians. Yeah, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 12. Okay, read out that one. Yes. That, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and ye in him, according to the grace of our God and the Amen. Lord of Jesus Christ. Okay. Very interesting. Amen. So the, the, uh, if you just focus there, you can understand. It says the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. The grace of of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Is here Apostle Paul again addressing the two different God? Is this is addressing to the separate persons in the, in the Godhead? Okay, one is the Lord Jesus Christ and the other one is the grace of our God. Now understand, here again Paul is simply acknowledging all the different roles of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is not only our Savior. He is not only the Lord, you know, Jehovah, the Savior. He is not only the Messiah, but at the same time, He is our God. That, that is exactly what you just read of, isn't it? What does Revelation 21 verse 7 say? It? That Jesus said, I will be, amen, yeah. your God, and you will be my son. Is that clear now? So Paul is making us a kind of a summarizing for us so that we can understand the fullness of the Godhead, so that we can understand, okay, who are who God, you know, who are, uh, our God is, so that we can better understand all the attributes, the roles of our Lord Jesus Christ, and that is exactly what He's saying over here. If you look at again in this Thessalonians one twelve, He you know, said, "The grace of our God." Okay, but for pause for a moment. Who is our God? According to the New Testament, and that's. Uh, be specific okay specifically let's uh, try to analyze about the theology of Paul okay Paul is saying the grace of our God so now let's try to analyze this let's try to understand who is our God what does the apostle Paul say about God how does he uh, you know say to the people about God okay coming back again the same one Colossians 2 9 very clear Paul is saying that in Christ Jesus dwell all the fullness of the Godhead. Amen. That means in the Godhead, you have the role of the Father, you have the role of the Son, you have the role of the Holy Spirit. Paul is saying that everything that you need, that everything is about God, is all in Jesus Christ. That in Him, everything that you want to see, it's in Christ Jesus. If you want to see him as God, he is the God. If you want to see him as a father, he is a father. If you want to see him as Jehovah, he is Jehovah. But then why did he need to say this? The grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Please understand that it is always important for us as a believer to accept God in all his roles. All right. Otherwise, he abuses because of the Greek word and... So whenever the Greek word and is there, if you try to take it literally and if you interpret it that God was a separate God, the Lord is a separate God, and if you, you know, Lord Jesus is a separate God, and if you go like that, you will end up having more than four or five persons. Example, you can see that in Ephesians chapter 4. Let's go down to the Ephesians chapter 4. Okay, let's... Uh, Focus on verse uh, 4, 5, and 6. Okay? Now, if, this is, if that is how that we are going to uh, interpret the Bible, then we will definitely face a lot of problem understanding who God is. For example, Ephesians 4, verse 6, there is one body and one spirit. Underline one spirit. And we know the essence of God is a spirit. Now, one spirit is one spirit. The spirit is S is a capital, which means Paul is talking about the Almighty God. Paul is talking about the deity of God. Paul is talking about the God who created heavens and earth. Now remember, one spirit is also referring to God Himself because S is a capital, number one. 
So now let's assume for a moment that the Paul is trying to address to the people at the church at Ephesus, if he's giving a message that if, uh, you know, if there were uh, the multiples of God in the Godhead, then you can say, in verse 4, you already have one God, one spirit, that's God. Again, you can come to verse 5. Here you have one Lord. Again, you have the two gods. And then you can come to verse 6. You have a three gods, because he goes on to say one God, and then it ends. If you don't understand, the Greek word end is referring to the same person. Okay, if you don't understand, this is the Greek word end is referring to the same okay, being. Then if you take it separately, then you have again a father separate. So then you end up having five gods. Spirit God, Lord God, and you have one God, a separate God, and you have another God who is called the Father. So here in this way, you will end up having more than four gods or five gods. I think that is something we will not do, right? Because we know that the seventh theme, the seventh message of the Bible is that one God, one God, right? So, and also I already stated yesterday that if we interpret in that manner, that we will end up believing in politism. So what does it mean by politism? That's what? What does, what, did, what does it mean by politism? What did I say yesterday? What is politism? And therefore on Tuesday, you will have this assessment. Okay, be careful. What does it mean by politism, Zon? What did I told you yesterday? What is politism? Heavy, heavy more than one God. Yes. Okay, poly is a Greek word for many. Okay. Theo means God. So when you say a politician, it means a belief in many gods. That's the meaning. Is that clear now? Clear? Yes. yes. All right, thank you. So that means that violates the whole scripture, isn't it? Because that means you're believing in such a pagan doctrine. You're believing in the, the doctrines of the heathens. You're believing in the many doctrine. Because nowhere in the Holy Scripture says that we have many gods. We don't have a many gods. Amen. Hallelujah. But yes, the Bible does tell us, the scripture tells us that God does have many roles, many attributes, many prerogatives. Okay? For example, if we talk about the attributes of God, we divide it in two, in the, you know, in, in, in two sections, all right? When you talk about the attributes of God in the biblical terms, we say, what is the moral attributes? And the other one is the divinity attribute, divine attributes. So what is divine attribute? Give me one example, Brother Benjamin. Divine attribute. Ours is this? Holiness. Okay, no, it would not come under divine, it would come under moral attributes. Holiness will come under moral attributes. What are divine attributes? Uh, eternity. Eternity, yes. Immutability, amen. Such as unchanging God, such as uh, that is omnipresent, omnipotent, omniscient. These are all divine attributes, okay? So when we study uh, these, uh, the doctrines of God, Theology proper, okay? Then we'll understand what does it mean by this divine attributes. Divided into two. Divided attributes and we call it moral attributes. Moral attribute also is not limited to just one attribute, such as mercy, okay? Love, such as grace. Isn't it? So it's just holiness, holy, etc. Now all these things are known as divine attributes. Part of divine attributes. Therefore, what does Zod say? In first Zod to the four verse seven and eight, he said, God is love. Amen, isn't it? But what does Apostle Zod say again in the Gospel of Zod? The Zod to the four verse twenty-four, God is spirit, amen. Was he right? Yes, he was right. Remember, at first he was talking about divine attribute, and he said, God is a spirit. 
Okay. Okay. Now remember, first zone, the author is Apostle Zone. Now, even the Gospel Zone, the author is Apostle Zone again. But then you can see one example is that here he say God is a spirit, but over here in first zone. 4, 7, and 8, he said, Beloved, let us love another, for God is love. Amen. Was he right? Yes, he was right. But he was making a distinction. He was distinction. He made, you know, a distinction between the two attributes. One is called divine attribute, and the other one is a moral attribute. So when you talk about the divine attribute, such as God is spirit, God is eternity, immutability. Okay, God is... In all my present, all this sign, etc., etc. All these are under the divine attributes. Yes, we have many attributes in the Bible. We can see the many attributes of God in the Bible. Okay, divine attributes, and including the moral attribute. But nowhere in the Bible says that God, the God of the Bible, the God of Abraham, Jacob, and Isaac, or the God of the New Testament, the God of the Old Testament, is many. Nowhere in the Bible says that. Amen. But instead, what does the Bible tell us? What does the Bible tell us in the Old Testament about how many God do we have? All right? Let's begin with reading from, for example, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Isn't it? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is 2, 3, 4. No. What does it say? 1. Amen. All right? And that is the reason why the book of Isaiah, for example, Isaiah 44, verse 6. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, the Lord of hosts, Say that I am the first and I am the last. Beside me there is no God. Amen. All right. When you come back to the New Testament, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. There is only one God. There is only one Lord. What about James chapter 2 verse 19? All right. Even the New Testament thus speaks about, okay, that there is only one God in another. Let's turn the Bible to James 2 19. James chapter 2 verse 19. <clears throat> Alright, here it says, Thou believest, thou believest that there is one God. Underline. Does it say there is many gods? Is there any scripture reference in the Old Testament and the New Testament? Is there any Bible references in the Holy Bible? Where it clearly says that there are many gods, okay? As we all know, it is nothing in the Bible. Amen. According to the Holy Scripture, we can see the same message is being repeatedly, okay, declared and testified, proclaims again and again in the Old Testament as well as in the New Testament that there is one God. So even James says here, Thou believest that there is one God, thou dost well. The, even the devils be, also believes and tremble. You see that? One God, one God, one God. Be it in the Old Testament or be it in the New Testament, the same message will be repeated again and again and again and again. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Yeah. So therefore we have been saying that according to the Holy Scripture, the central message of the Bible is... There is one God. Alright? And then, there's a reason why I understand. There's a reason why we understand it's salutations. Okay? That means greetings. Therefore, the salutation in the epistles. Okay? Therefore, the greetings in the epistles, we understand that do not indicate any distinctions of persons in the Godhead. Amen. I repeat again. Therefore, we conclude that the salutations, or you can say the greetings, in the epistles do not indicate any distinctions of persons in God. At the most, we understand the use of God in these cases denotes a distinction. Okay? I repeat again. The use of Kai, the Greek word Kai, which is and, in these cases, denotes a distinction of roles. Everybody remember? Roles. 
Can you say it together with me? Rolls. Rolls. Everybody say rolls. Rolls. Okay. Manifestation. Manifestation. A bit louder. Manifestation. Or names. Names. Or names. Three things. So therefore, if it does indicate any distinctions, then in all these cases could indicate a distinction of roles. That means I have many roles, you have many roles. For example, even a human being is not limited. Even one individual human being is not limited to just one role, isn't it? You can play a multiple of roles. Even an actor can play a multiple of roles. For example, okay, in a one flame, you can even play a multiple of roles. Isn't it? You can play as a father, you can play as a mother, you can play as a brother, you can play a lot. Like even an actor performing in the theater, in the drama, right? You can play a multiple of roles. You can play as a father, after some time you can change your dress, and you can come as, you can, okay, play the role of a son. Okay, you can act like a son, and you can go back and change the dress, and you can also play the role of a grandfather. But then you remain the same person. So therefore, the, remember even the word uh, in the Latins, okay? Persons. The Latin word for person is simply known as persona. Okay, very interesting. Now the word person is derived from the Latin word persona, which means an actor, all right? Who plays a different kind of roles that also the meaning so therefore I told you that an actor can play a multiple of roles you can play a role of the father a role of a son a role of a grandfather but that is makes you three persons amen you're the same person you're the same one but you have many roles for example you hear as a student you are you role in the ABT as a regular student correct but then, during your free hours of time, if you are taking a tuition, if you're giving a tuition to the students, to the uh, high school level students, uh, to the elementary, uh, your kindergarten students, then you're playing the role of, you're fulfilling the role of being a teacher, isn't it? Am I right? Yes. But only when you come to this building, all right, to continue and to study your bachelor in theology, for example, then you're fulfilling your role as a regular student. Okay, and you want to be a discipline and you want to be a responsible student, and therefore you come in time and you always attend all your classes, your chapels on time. All right, and you're fulfilling your role as a student. But during the off time of periods, for example, from 1:30 to 4:30, or let's say up to 5 p.m., we don't have any classes, right? Now let's say between this 1.30 to 5, these are free hours. During your free hour, if you're giving a tuition to the students, to other students, high school level students, and if you're teaching a math or science or something, some other subjects, then you are again fulfilling your role as a teacher. Am I right? But that doesn't mean that you're two different persons. In the same way, understand, <coughs> the use of Kai, in these cases, denote the distinctions of roles and manifestations or names by which man knows God in at least some cases the use of God actually identify Jesus as the same being as God for example uh, John 20 verse 28 is the best example where Thomas cried out and said my Lord and what is next my God amen all right so therefore here we can see that in the, uh, in the case of this uh, John 20 verse 28, that Jesus as the same being and the same God. So the same being as a father. All right? Therefore, Thomas cried out and said, My Lord and my God. And even Jesus Christ testifies, proclaims that he is actually the same as a father. He said again in John 10, 30, I and my father are one. And he goes on to say in verse 14. Okay, in chapter 14, verse 10, I am the Father, and you see, the Father is in me. So, therefore, let us keep in our mind that in the New Testament, 
or even in the Old Testament, the salutations, which are the greetings in the Holy Bible, do not indicate any distinctions of persons in Godhead. Okay? And with the finals, before we wrap up, I wanted to remind yourself in Colossians 2 9 again. Let's run the Bible. This is a very, very important Bible reference for us. Colossians 2 9. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all the principalities and powers.